When we came down off the mountain with our rocket, all the observers were gone, but Buck and the football team were back. They were at our blockhouse, tearing it apart, board by board, using tire irons. We roared and ran at them. Come on, little sister morons, Buck screamed, red in his face. We were no match for them, but we had to do something. I picked up a rock and the other boys did the same. We let loose a barrage, missing for the most part, but making them dodge. They charged us and we knew we were doomed. Then we heard a car horn and Tag Farmer drove his old Mercury out on the slack. While we, football boys and rocket boys, all froze in place, Tag leisurely got out and pushed his constable's cap to the back of his head. So what's going on, boys? He drawled. Nothing, I said. I wasn't about to turn Buck in. Boys in Colwood just didn't do that. We were just cleaning up the range. Tag nodded toward Buck and the others still standing with their fists balled, the tire irons in their hands. They helping you? Yes, sir. Tag strolled over to the block house, musing over the planks that had been ripped out. Buck, he called softly. Buck meekly went to the constable. Yes, sir. You a carpenter? No, no, sir. It might be time to learn. Looks like some boards came loose on this block house. Yes, sir. You going to take care of this? Yes, sir. Tag nodded. Buck stooped and picked up the boards. I came over and handed him a hammer from the tool chest we always carried with us, and he got busy. Tag chuckled and stayed around until everybody left. On Sunday morning, I pretended to oversleep, part of Dad's plan to avoid trouble, and Mom flung open the door to my room. Get up or you're going to miss Sunday school. I was about to fib to her, but I had decided it was okay since it was for her good. I'm pretty worn out, doing so much homework and all. Would you mind if I skip today, just this once? She turned and went out of the room. If you want to be a heathen, who am I to stop you? She went bawling after Jim to get out of the bathroom and drive her to church. He answered back that he had only been in there for a couple of minutes. I figured it had been at least an hour. After Jim and Mom left for church, I walked up the path to the tipple where Dad waited for me. I was almost shaking with excitement. I had lived in Colwood my whole life, but had never been where Dad was going to take me. I was going in the mine, and the fact that he'd asked me, not Jim, had grown even more important through the week whenever I thought about it. He eyed me carefully when I came into his office. You didn't say a word about this to your mother, did you? No, sir, I said it loud and proud. Right. We'll get you washed up afterward and she won't ever know the difference. That part of dad's plan I had my doubts about, but I happily went along with it. He knew mom better than I did, after all. Come over here, he beckoned, spreading a map of the mine on a table. He pointed at a winding black streak that ran across it. That's the number four Pocahontas seam, the finest and purest soft coal in the world. These lines I've drawn represent the tunnels we've driven through it since the mine has been operational. He opened a drawer and brought out another drawing. This is the side view of a typical seam. The coal is overlaid by a hard shale called draw rock. Underneath is what we call jack rock. Engineers have to know how to hold up the draw rock to keep it from falling and how to move the jack rock out of the way. Doing the engineering in a mine takes a lot of experience and careful calculations. Dad continued while searching my eyes. I think he was looking for a glimmer of understanding Men who work under those roofs depend on the mining engineers to do it right the first time. It's not like your rocket men, those crazy German scientists, just throwing something up to see if it will work. I resisted the urge to answer that charge, and Dad lectured on. The coal company used the block system, he said. 
each block being 75 feet by 90 feet. Entries were driven through them in sets of four. After that, the blocks were taken out by continuous mining machines one by one until each of them was only about 15 feet square. Those remaining blocks were called pillars, which were also eventually mined. During all of it, roof, bolts, and posts and cribs all had to be calculated and set to hold the roof up. Then, Dad went off into his favorite subject, ventilating air through the mine. If the air stops circulating, methane will seep out of the coal and build up, Dad said. One spark and the whole mine could explode. To keep that from happening, we use a pressure system. Fans raise the pressure in the mine to a little greater than the surface pressure. The methane is blown out through the vents. You designed that, I asked. I did a good portion of it, he answered, glancing down at his drawings. I was confused on this point. So you're an engineer? He toyed with a slide rule. No, an engineer has a degree. I decided to use some of Mr. Hartfield's deductive reasoning. Jake Mosby's an engineer, I said. That's right. You know a lot more about coal mining than he does. That's true. I shrugged. Then you're an engineer, right? Dad shook his head. Sonny, you have to have a diploma from a college to be an engineer. I don't have one. That means I can never be an engineer. He looked at me speculatively. But you could. Not knowing what to say, I didn't reply, but kept studying the drawings. This is interesting, I said and meant it. Dad led me to the bathhouse and opened his locker and handed me a one-piece overall, hard toe boots, a white foreman's helmet, and a leather utility belt. When I joined him at the man hoist, he showed me how to clip a lamp battery pack onto my belt and the lamp on my helmet. With the lamp attached, the helmet felt heavy. I moved it around until it felt comfortable. He appraised me and readjusted the helmet then my belt until the buckle was squared in the front and the battery hung exactly off my right hip. I felt like a soldier under inspection. Now, you look like a mine foreman, he said. After another critical assessment, let's go. The attendant swung the gate aside and for the first time in my life, I stepped onto the wooden plank platform of the lift. I thought of all the times when I was a small child and had watched the miners descend into the darkness. Now it was my turn. I could feel my heart speed up. The boards in the floor were set apart enough that I could see between them. There was nothing beneath us but a dark chasm. I had a momentary twinge of fear that we were going to fall. The bell rang three times announcing that we were about to be let down. I took a deep, ragged breath. The man hoist winch began to creak and the lift dropped quiet. The man hoist winch began to creak and the lift dropped quickly, my stomach lifting up around my throat. I grabbed Dad's arm, then quickly let go in embarrassment. He said nothing, and I watched the solid rock of the shaft slip past. Men had hand dug the shaft, but I couldn't imagine how. It had taken me and the boys all day just to dig out a little place for our blockhouse at Cape Colwood. Through the gaps in the floor, I started to see lights far below. Above us, the square of light at the top of the shaft had shrunk to a tiny twinkling star. We were being swallowed by the earth, and I hadn't decided yet whether I liked that. I remembered that Tag had frozen at the bottom of the shaft, refusing to get off the lift. Now I understood his fear very well. When we neared the bottom, the lift slowed, jerked a few times, and then settled level with a rock platform. I switched on my helmet light. There were miners waiting on the platform. Mr. Dubonnet was among them. He looked at me with surprise. A new hire, Homer? He'll need to join the union. Sonny's thinking about becoming a mining engineer, Dad snapped, a company man. Well, well, Mr. Dubonnet replied with a noticeable lack of enthusiasm. 
Now, wouldn't that be something? Solid gray walls surrounded us. I felt almost as if I were on some alien planet. All the things I'd ever known that oriented me, trees, the sky, the mountains, none of them was around. The air even smelled different, like wet gunpowder. Off to the right was a set of tracks with a big yellow electric locomotive sitting on it, some cars behind. I could see a connecting tunnel to the left, the blue haze of fluorescent lights showing through the window into a concrete block building. Hot white flashes and rapid hisses with an indicated arc welding. Dad saw me looking. We put a little machine shop down here. Saves time bringing out equipment that needs repair. Is Mr. Bykovsky in there? I wondered. Dad rocked on his hard toe boots. Ike's not a machinist anymore, Sonny. He's a loader and a damn good one. He stepped forward. Come on, let's get on down the line. Dad led me to the locomotive, stopping to talk to its operator. I recognized him, Mr. Weaver, whose son, Harry, was five grades ahead of me. Harry had gone in the Marine Corps, had landed in Lebanon when President Eisenhower had decided to help out over there. Mr. Weaver sat on the front with a lever to control the power to the locomotive's electric motors. Hey, Sonny, he greeted. Hey, sir. Take us all the way to the base, Frank. Dad said, you got it. Dad took me to an attached car he called a man trip. It was a low slung steel car with two hard metal benches inside that faced each other. We crawled inside the man trip and sat side by side facing forward. Dad slapped the top to let Mr. Weaver know we were ready to go. The man trip lurched and we were off plunging down what seemed an endless black tunnel. Dad said we were on the main line. For 20 minutes, the rails clacked beneath us, the posts holding up the rock roof, blurring past like a subterranean forest of gray tree trunks. On straightaways, the locomotive roared as we flew down the track, the man trip rattling and shaking. I could smell the hot odor of the locomotive's electric motor. Before we got to a curve, Mr. Weaver applied the brakes and the steel wheels of the locomotive and our man trip squealed like a thousand tortured pigs. I held the steel seat with my hands between my legs so I wouldn't fall over when we took the curves. As we sped along, I occasionally saw the flash of miners lamps down branching tunnels, but it was too dark to see what they were doing. At my question about them, dad said they were dusting, spreading rock dust around to hold down the explosive mixture of coal dust and air. It registered on me after a time that the mine was not the cold, dank, ugly place I'd always imagined it to be. The air was cool and dry. And when we stopped at a switch, to let a line of low coal cars go past us, I peered down the tunnel and the mica and the rock wall sparkled like diamonds. I remembered then that dad had once brought some mica crystals home with him and left them on the kitchen table for mom, along with a card that said, you always wanted diamonds, but these are the best I can do. I wish they were real. The next morning waiting for him on the table was mom's note of reply. I never wanted diamonds. I only wanted a little of your time. That's still all I want. But she didn't throw dad's diamonds away. I knew I had come across them and the notes while looking for some writing paper in her desk. When the man trip stopped, dad jumped out. We've got an operation going at the face today, he said. I want you to see it. When I climbed out, I stood up and slammed my helmet into the roof so hard it almost knocked me to my knees. I staggered, then looked up to see what I had hit and saw slabs of rock, roof bolts jammed into them every few feet. Dad ignored my trouble and took off at a fast pace, never looking back.